So now I'd like to step back and look a little deeper into this dynamic trading uh, options payoff world that we've started investigating. Uh, spanning state prices and later how current models of option pricing work. Um, as one interesting way to start looking at this, let's, let's look at our friend the discount factor, which is something we've studied uh, for a long time. And what I've done here, uh, we had a formula for the discount factor in terms of a shock epsilon. We had a formula for the stock price in terms of a shock epsilon. Let's substitute out the epsilon and write the discount factor in terms of the stock price. So that's just eliminating epsilon from those two equations. And the result is this equation here. Yuck, what does it say? No, it's not that bad. It's just the usual mu's, r's, and sigma's. And then in place of the epsilon, we have the stock price. Uh, and the stock price is raised to mu, mu minus r over sigma squared, a, uh, a combination of parameters you've seen often. And here's what it looks like. Uh, stock price raised to a negative power is, is something like that. So that's telling us the discount factor, the state price, the marginal utility, uh, the X star that, that we've been looking at all along. It tells us what, is, uh, what does marginal utility look like? How, how hungry are people in different states of nature in order to generate the stock prices and, and means uh, that, that we see? And it says, as you might expect, that as stock prices go down, marginal utility rises, people are hungrier, the state price rises. We can summarize uh, what we've learned about this world by this state price density. There's a contingent claim is something that would pay one unit given one value of, of ST. And this gives us a sense the contingent claims for payoffs and bad states of nature uh, are, are very valuable. Now let's con contrast that to what we've done before. Before we found X star, X star when we had a stock and a bond, R and RF, we found a formula for X star, and that was our friend X star that priced the stock and the bond. The form of that thing is it's a constant and then it's a linear function of R. R is ST minus S naught. So the old X star was a linear function of ST minus X naught. Wait a minute, what's going on? Right, this was the, the discount factor that prices stock and bonds. That's a discount factor that prices stock and bonds. Why are they so different? Well. This is the discount factor that is, th th that is only a linear function of stock and bonds. It's also traded portfolio. And it prices the stock and bond when you're not allowed to do any intermediate trading. This is a discount factor that prices all managed portfolios, all dynamic possibilities. It's in the payoff space, but it's not, it's not in, the, it, it's a, you have to do some managed portfolios to create that as a payoff described right here. So what do I mean by it's a discount factor for all managed portfolios? Well, think about a, a portfolio whose value is V and that you're managing by changing its weight on stocks, by changing the investment in stocks with a weight W. So that V, the, the, uh, the value process goes up as RDT plus then the weight in stocks times what stocks do. By changing, by dynamically changing the value that you put in stocks, you can get all sorts of interesting terminal values of this payoff. This is how we generate interesting combinations of contingent claims by uh, dynamic, dynamically trading assets. And this discount factor prices all of those contingent claims. And it is a contingent claim of that sort. It is a portfolio that is a nonlinear function in this case of ST. So it's the same idea in just the much larger portfolio space, the larger payoff space of uh, all managed portfolios. <laughs> now let's continue that line of thought. Uh, and, and let's continue that even if the Black-Scholes formula doesn't hold. This is a formula I derived when the Black-Scholes formula does hold. How do these kinds of ideas keep working when the Black-Scholes formula doesn't hold? So imagine we want, to, we want to think about payoffs like option payoffs that are any function of the final stock price. And the spanning theorems tell us that any function of that sort you can get in two ways. One way is by changing the W's, by dynamically trading the stock and bond, by being clever enough about the W process, you can get to just about any function you want. Another way you can get to just about any function you want is by mixing put and call options. So there's a lovely spanning result two securities that you change the, uh, change the investments in them dynamically 
gives you the same amount of final payoffs as you can get by all puts and calls with all different strike prices. And those are also equivalent to, both of these things are equivalent to what we call complete markets, meaning every contingent claim as a function of the stock price is, uh, is traded. Now that leads us to, when Black-Scholes fails, how would we find our discount factor, our contingent claims price? Uh, that looks like an unpleasant job, doesn't it? Now, we had it before. There was x prime p e of x, x prime inverse times x. What's a similar procedure for finding the contingent claims price, uh, stochastic discount factor, and so forth, from a given set of option prices? And here's the lovely fact. You can find the discount factor from the second derivative of call option prices with respect to strike. So call option prices are equivalent to contingent claims. And the way you can translate two contingent claims from call option prices is by taking the second derivative of call option price relative to strike. How does that work? Let me show you a cute little drawing that explains it all. Suppose that what you do is you set up what's called a butterfly. A butterfly is a bet on low volatility. So you buy one call option at this strike price. You buy another call option at this higher strike price, and you sell two call options at the intermediate strike price. Add up those three call option payoffs, and you have a little blip that pays off only if the stock price is in that area. You can see what we're doing. As epsilon goes to zero, we're creating a contingent claim. The equation version, the, pr the payoff of that contingent claim is epsilon squared. The price is call option price of the higher one, of the lower one, minus the two you sold at the middle, plus the one you bought at the right. But wait, c of x minus epsilon, that is the second derivative times epsilon squared. Therefore, if you buy one over epsilon squared of these itty bitty little butterflies, uh, the price of that thing is the second derivative of call with respect to price. The second derivative of a call with respect to price is the price of a contingent claim that pays off only when the stock price gets to just one value. And bingo, once you have contingent claims prices, you know how to price everything. The price of any, let's think of any function of the final payoff, x of st, we can find the price of any x of st like that by price is integral contingent claims price times final payoffs. Multiply and divide by probabilities and you've got yourself a discount factor. Multiply or, or re divide by the interest rate, you've got yourself a set of risk neutral uh, probabilities with which to price final payoffs. So all of our ideas of connecting discount factors, contingent claims prices, uh, in, in complete markets work in this sense as well. And now you know, given call option prices, how to do that operation, how to find the contingent claims prices or discount factor from the call price and how to make plots like this how to find out what people are really willing to pay for various states of nature.